you know, if I'm going to do something, I'm putting, you know, it's something that's really big to me, you know. So I, my name, my, Zach is what I go by, but I'm actually, my first name's actually Tilden. My dad's name is Tilden. My grandfather's name is Tilden. Uh, if I ever have a son, his name's going to be Tilden. It's just, it's, it, it, the, the family name is important to me. So I, if I do something, I'm not just representing me. I'm representing my wife. I'm representing my kids. I'm representing my dad, my granddad. I'm representing every Fleming that came before me. I'm representing Dobbins Bennett. I'm representing Kingsport. You know, I've, that just has been ingrained in me by my, my, my family from such a young age that ownership to me is that what I'm doing, it impacts not just me, it impacts everybody around me. Welcome to the Built to Last podcast, a community for coaches founded on the principles encourage, equip, and empower. We are performance coaches working for eternal purpose. Now, here are your co-hosts, Charlie Ray and Justin Ventavania. Hey guys, welcome back to Built to Last. We are excited about this episode with Coach Zach Fleming. He is the head strength and conditioning coach at Dobbins Bennett High School. He's also the faculty advisor for the FCA huddle there, and he is um, a Tennessee advisory board member for the NHSSCA. Um, Coach Fleming was phenomenal from start to finish. I remember I was writing so fast, just trying to get all the notes down. And uh, we feel like you guys will be doing the same. So, Charlie, I know you're actually the one that that brought us Coach Fleming, though. Do you want to talk a little bit about your relationship with him and how you got to know him? Yeah, for sure. So Coach Fleming and I actually played football together at Carson Newman University. And he was two years older than me, but uh, he ended up staying there and becoming our graduate assistant. So I was actually around him for almost six years He's a phenomenal man of God. He's got lots of energy. Guys, in this episode, he talks about things from a public high school setting, specifically living on mission. He talks about his family, core values, and also we go into a little bit of strength and conditioning with his mindset and his movement with his overall coaching philosophy. Finally, at the end, we really did a great job explaining the ins and outs of how to be on mission. So I hope you guys sit back, enjoy this episode, and get a lot out of it. Hey guys, welcome back to Built to Last. We're here with Coach Zach Fleming. Zach, how are you doing today? Doing well, guys. Doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, super excited, man. So, uh, you know, quick background. Zach and I played football together at Carson Newman University back in the day, Division II school up in uh, East Tennessee. That's kind of where our paths crossed. And uh, he kind of got into strength and conditioning, is in the high school world. And so uh, super excited to do this podcast. But Coach, just give us a quick background as to, uh, you know, what's your story with strength and conditioning? How'd you get in it, and why are you in it? So, so yeah, actually, with, at Carson Newman, I uh, I was an undergrad. My major in undergrad was uh, youth ministry, more on that recreational side, youth ministry. And uh, I, I remember I was going into my very last class my senior year. It was the history of the Baptist people. I sat down. I, I enjoyed the class. I just sat down, though, and I was like, man, I don't – I'd worked at a, a church for two years. I was like, man, I don't, I don't want to work in a church. Like, not that I didn't like it, not that I didn't think the church is, you know, a worthy place to be in, but I was like, man, I just, I feel alive when I'm around people, like when I'm coaching, when I'm, when I'm through sport, you know, I had some injuries uh, at Carson Newman, like 8 million shoulder surgeries. So, um, you know, I, I, I went, I remember going one day to, to Coach Redding, my defensive line coach, and I said, listen, coach, I, I just want to contribute somehow. And I'm in a sling. I don't, I don't, I don't know how I, I can help this team. And so he just kind of said, well, hey, it was the springtime. We had a lot of kids coming in. He said, once you help some of the new guys, just kind of understand what's going on, just kind of get them you know, acquainted with what we're doing. Man, I fell in love. I love it. just the relationships that you built, built through that. Like it, when I worked in the church, it was – I don't know if I just didn't – I didn't have the ability or what, but I just I, – I really struggled to connect with some of the kids just because I didn't understand some of the things they were going through. But at least, you know, helping with football, like I had that connection. And then we could start digging deeper and deeper. And so after that, man, any chance I got to jump into coaching, I did. I changed my major. I stayed, like I said, you know, we talked about. I stayed on at Carson Newman, got my master's in education, and uh, and, and then went on to, to get an exercise science degree. So I kind of knew what was going on. But the way I got into the strength and conditioning, you know, when I was a GA, they let me take in the, uh, the red shirt and the JV team. So, you know, Coach Redding had the, the varsity guys, did all that program. Um, but, but they let me take over the, the freshman JV program, and I, I mean, I fell in love with it in there, just the way that it taught you life. Not that football, not that sports didn't, but just 
the, the opportunities that existed in the weight room and, and the, the differences that you could have in all the kids and the conversations you could have. I just fell in love with it. Um, so, you know, I did, my, did two years there. I did, you know, worked with football, worked with a couple other sports, worked with some high school kids. Uh, and when my time got up, I, I remember calling my high school coach and just said, hey, I just need a job. I don't, I don't, I'll do anything. I don't care. I just, I don't care how much it pays. I mean, as a GA, Division two, you don't make anything anyway. So just, <laughs> I'll go anywhere. Just if you know anybody, let me know. And so like two weeks later, he called me and said that they would, they had a, uh, uh, a grant funded, which meant it just lasted the rest of the year. So it was like for four months, they had a grant funded position. And uh, he said, if you're willing to come up here, I need a defensive line coach and, and I need somebody helping the weight room. Heck yeah, I, I would love to do that. So I was driving back and forth about an hour and a half every day. I was teaching in Morristown. But so I was, uh, I drove back and forth and, at the end of that year, they ended up deciding that they wanted to hire a full-time strength coach. And so they kind of had a sample of what I was going to do because I did it for four months. Mm -hmm. Not that the other guys that applied weren't good strength coaches. I just, I think they, there was a lot of unknown and, you know, the Lord really had his hand in that, that I was there and kind of got to give them a sample of what it was going to be like. And so, you know, now, you know, I've been in Dobbins Bennett ever since. And man, I, you know, kind of like I said, Early on, I thought, man, I was going to do football, be a football coach. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah, man. Once I spent some time in the weight room, I really fell in love with the, the, the way you got to really impact so many kids' lives in so many different ways, and the conversations you could have. I knew that if I ever had to pick between the two, the strength conditioning is what I wanted to do. So that's kind of how I got into it, and I'm thankful that I still get to be in it. You know, in the, in the high school setting. Yeah, and that's it's a phenomenal story. I mean, I love asking that question because, you know, everybody has their own story, but just hearing kind of the progression of like you took a risk, you had to trust the Lord, you you reached back out to your high school coach. And it's cool to see that ultimately, I mean, we started this podcast built to last with the idea of like building lasting impact. And you're saying right there that, you know, you had an opportunity football where you're kind of limited with some of the impact or strength conditioning in the weight room, you're touching, you know, you have multiple impact on a lot of different athletes and styles. And that's something that's been so cool to kind of hear uh, through our friendship and just catching up and, and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I really appreciate your story. And it's cool to see the the uniqueness of it, uh, how you stepped out in faith, really trusting the Lord and, and he provided. And coach, if you don't mind now, I appreciate you. Like, like Charlie said, giving us the background. Do you mind talking about currently what you're doing in the weight room and what your coaching philosophy is? Uh, I've probably got around, Currently on the roster, I got 402 kids. Now I've got to add a couple because some kids are going to get in my classes that, that were not on an athletic roster, um, but that'll be about 20 more kids. So, you know, around 400 kids every year. Uh, that's not including our middle school because COVID year, we don't, we, we can't, couldn't do that. Um, but so, you know, we've, we've got so many kids in the weight room uh, and so such a, a low training age that really my, my philosophy has, has changed a whole, whole lot from early on, it was, this is what we're doing. This is the way we're going to do it. This is when we're going to do it. This is how we're going to do it. Like, this is it, period. This is my, this is my opinion. My opinion matters, not yours. Like, this is what we're doing. Uh, I've now changed more to my, like, the way I look at it is, all right, are we being consistent? I don't want you to show up one day a week and go super hard. I want you to show up all five school days and train consistently and hey, listen, that's, that's what I want. I consistently over a long period of time, those those small little uh, dividends you're going to get that that builds up. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, you don't get any better. You can't build relations. I don't talk to my wife once a week. I don't spend time with the Lord once a week. I got, why would you just spend you know? So so my my emphasis is consistently getting in there. And once they develop that habit, then we're going to start working on. You know, I, I worry about. You know, are we training every movement? You know, I used to kind of just think, oh, I want to squat, I want to bitch, I want to clean, I want to do this, 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 and this. Um, what movements do I want to do? What am I trying to develop? Is it lower body strength? Okay, is it unilateral strength? What, is, you know, what are we working on for the day? What is this kid, you know, what, what's their injury? Like, it's more athlete focused rather than just, here's my program, you guys just do it. It's, mm -hmm. and listen, I, I had to really, you know, we talk about trust. I didn't trust that the kids would do it when I gave them responsibility. So I, I was too controlling. Yeah. That's why the program wasn't great early on because I want to control everything rather than enable our kids to take ownership and really 
you know, okay, hey, today, you know, this is what you need to be doing. I'll give you a choice between these exercises. What are you most comfortable with? Okay, you do that. Okay, well, that kid's doing something different. So I went from a very uniformed in terms of we all do the exact same training to now we do the exact same training, but it's not the exact same sets, reps, and exercises. It's this is what we're trying to develop, and we're going to make it work for you. Not for me, for you, because you're not here for me. I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. so my yeah. changed over time. Yeah, that is awesome. And I think like one of the things I'm kind of hearing you say is um, development. Okay, consistency, a key to your program and how you design it is trying to develop. It's, it's crazy. Uh, same thing with me. I came in early and it's like, this is how it's done, this, this, this. And it's like, as you build that relationship, you're like, man, it's not going to work in this militaristic mindset where it's just us being a dictator. Instead, you know, it sounds like what I'm hearing you say is empowering the kids and I mean, you still have structure, but you, there's some freedom within it to kind of give them uh, opportunities to develop even further because not everybody is at the same training age. Would you say that's a, a good way to summarize your program? Yeah, and I think one of the important things to, to note about that is just because you give up some stuff, like that doesn't mean we don't have intensity. That doesn't mean the kids aren't training hard. That doesn't mean anything like that. That's what I was scared of. I thought when I gave mm -hmm. up that control that I couldn't be the person that dictated the energy and intensity. Yeah, but what happened was I was limiting our energy and intensity because mm -hmm. I was making it all come from me. When I let the kid let it come from the kids, now the kids, you know, like when they got that ownership, they're excited about being in there. Not just, it's not just oh, let's go get yelled at by Coach Fleming, you know. Now it's hey, let's get. I want to get in there. I want to be in there. That, you know, can I, Coach, can I come in extra? Can I come in on other days? Now they're they're helping coach up other kids rather than me having to coach 40, 50 kids. Now I've got forty or fifty coaches. You know, yeah, so wow. level steps up where I was scared it was going to pull back. And so again, just letting go and not, not letting me be in control, uh, structuring it, like you said, but not giving up some control really goes along a lot farther than I thought it was going to. Yeah, no, it, I've noticed the same thing. Like when you, when you're able to really teach the athletes and empower them, you almost, you're almost able to replicate yourself as a coach. And like, I mean, there's no other strength coaches. It's just kind of you, right? So it's like, you got to learn to replicate yourself and develop your leaders on the team to almost replicate yourself as, you know, building many assistant coaches, if you will. So, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's an awesome takeaway there. Hey, uh, transitioning a little bit. So one of the unique things about this podcast is we've interviewed tons of different guys, high school level, private sector, college. And I don't think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Justin, I don't think we've done public high school setting yet. If we have, I don't remember who, but What's, not public, what, yeah. Yeah, not public. We've done a few private. But what's the, the big difference, I guess, you know, with a public high school and you being a, a Christian who happens to be a strength coach, how do you live life on mission in that public high school setting? You know, I always go back to what did Jesus actually do? You know, he fed people. He, he clothed people. He was around people. You know, that's, he didn't turn. He didn't say, no, 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 you ain't good enough for me. He went to those who we thought were undesirable. He went to those who, who needed whatever it was, he went to them and he, he surrounded himself with them. You know, the unique thing again at the public, in the public setting is that we don't pick the kids we got, you know, they, they, there's, they live in Kingsport. They come to Donald's Bennett, you know, they, they're in our zone. They come here. Yeah. It's not, you know, there are some kids, sure. Every high school's got kids moving on tuition or this or that, but like they just, they're here because they're here. That's the only, they didn't say, Oh, what's the best, what's the highest academic school. I'm going to go there. Or I, not, not taking a shot at those, but we got who we got. And I'm, I'm, the more I'm here, the more convinced that the, the folks that we got are here for a reason. Mm -hmm. Got them at Dobbins Bennett for a reason. You know, uh, the, the, just the, the wide variety of just SES, stat, you know, status and needs and this and that and belief systems. And, you know, I, I know that, that that exists everywhere, but I think in the public setting, it's, it's almost – I've got a kid who I didn't see for a month because his, he didn't have a ride. He couldn't get the bus, didn't go to his house. Uh, everybody in his family is just not able to get him here. He's been, you know, and I know that happens other places, but, you know, I, this, that kid doesn't need the weight room so much as he just needs somebody to love on him. He yeah. needs somebody to be consistently in his life, you know, being a good example for him and, and providing him something that he doesn't have at home, which is that structure. Um, so I think, I think the public setting is, is not 
crazy different. It's just we got who we got. Whoever shows up, you know, the Lord is the Lord is putting them there for a reason. Yeah, they've been here whether it's from birth, from like moved in, whatever it is, they're here, and they need to be loved on. And that's that's something that I got to remind myself every single day. Um, you know, some of them are in there because it's a cool thing to do. Some of them are in there because they don't care if they're good at sports. They're just in the weight room that day. You know. Um, but they still need to be loved the same way as the kid that wants to be in there. You know, they, they've got the set, they got needs too. And, and the Lord's got me there, you know, being able to pour in their life for a reason. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's kind of where I, that's how I think you do it. Now, maybe that's, I think I say you kind of do it in general. You love people, <laughs> yeah. you, just, you feed them, you clothe them, you, you, you provide needs, you know, that's what I think. That's how you present the gospel. And then when you start having conversations, then you get to start sharing, you know, we've, we've been on a hybrid model. Uh, so kids will come two days at five and then they, everybody's on virtual on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, they go, the other group comes. So, you know, on Wednesday, I've had some kids that are struggling academically. Well, you know what we did? They, we, they come in, in the morning, they live with me. I go feed them breakfast. Then we sit down, we do their homework for a couple hours. We go eat lunch. We come back, we sit down a couple more hours then they go home. But what I didn't realize I was doing when we started that was developing relationships that not just the kids need, I needed too, you know, it was just, we, we had, I mean, we had 18 weeks. So 18 days, I've had them all school day, just me, you know, being able to just to sit and build relationships and, and help them. Wow. I mean, Matt, I can't help them in math, but I can encourage them, you know, <laughs> yeah. but I can be around them and I can, I can be a, a solid fixture in their life that they know is going to be there. And so when, then they start to be like, Oh shoot, coach Fleming cares about me, man. He's, I, you know, I don't know, what he's what what he's got going, but you know, I want I might want to listen a little bit, and so just some of the conversations, just by being again, letting the people being around people, being around the uh, some of those conversations. That's and then that's that's where you just start to share the gospel. Not necessarily. I don't have to come at you with the gospel. I can live it, and then we can talk about it. You know, one of the coolest things I've heard when when you talk about being a great witness for Jesus is um, witness, witness, witness. Then use your words. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's lifestyle, you know, and like you said, it sounds like you really are someone who practices what you preach coach, and, and we love that. Um, do you mind talking a little bit more about your, your core values, your family values, things like that? Um, well, and, and I think with values, I'm, I'm trying to, and this is something I've struggled with. My wife will let you know, like I, I'm not, because of the nature of how many kids we have and the amount of coaches and teams you work with I'm on my phone, a lot, you know, and, and so it's like, I'm trying to, my focus on what I want my value to be is be present where I'm at. Mm. I want people that I'm around to think that not just think to know that they are the most valuable, most important thing at that moment. Now I screw that up and I mess that up, but I, 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 I'm trying to maximize the time that I have with the people that I have. Cause I don't know, like, you know, so for example, with our kids, like they might be there one day and then, Oh, oh well, you're quarantined for two weeks. Shoot. Like what happens? Like, what if I never see the kid again? You know what? I, and so it's, you know, this time of COVID has helped me realize how important it is to not, to not take for granted the time you have with people and to really, really, really hone in on making every second, making the people around you understand that every second you're around them, they're the most important thing. You know, I want my, my wife to know that she's the most important thing to me when I'm around her. I want my kids to know that they're the most important thing, not Dobbins Bennett. I want my kids to know they're the most important. But when I'm at DB, I want them, I want the kids that I'm with there to know that they're most important. Um, and so I think, I think that's, I know that's really more of a growth thing, but that's something I value that I think going forward, that's right. That's what I want to, to improve the most. Um, and I, I think that that value stems from, again, loving people. I, I want to, I want folks to know that, that they're loved, that they're valued, that they mean something. Uh, even if sometimes the world says otherwise. Yeah. It, that value right there is, I mean, that's an incredible way to test, to be a testimony of, of what Christ did. You know, he focused in on the people he was with and to really listen, like think about it, to really listen to somebody, you have to get out of your shoes. You have to get out of your point, point of view and step into their world. Like you have, it, it is a selfless act to truly listen to somebody and not be thinking about what I'm going to ask next or, mm -hmm. or I got to mm -hmm. comment on something like to really 
zone in and listen to what they're saying. I mean, that that's selflessness. And so I think it's an amazing value. I think COVID has probably taught a lot of people that like, hey, we got to be fully present with where we're at. And, and that's something that I think is a, you know, a huge takeaway we can get from this. Um, what about with, uh, you know, so you're talking about COVID, the new challenges, okay, your, your family, obviously, and then your wife and taking care of your kids. How do you do that with work-life balance, but then also continuing to be successful at your job? Because it's so easy, whether it's high school sector, college sector, professional, private, whatever it is, it is so easy to make this thing an idol and get consumed with strength conditioning and just X's knows it's unlimited rabbit holes and trails of knowledge. You'll never, you'll never grow. You never learn everything about anything, you know? So it's like con continuously you can get distracted. What do you do to have like a work life balance? Something I have having to do, uh, I schedule stuff. Um, so like in the mornings, I, I tell my wife, my wife asks me all the time, like on the weekends, why do you get up at the same time on the weekends as you do during the week? I said, cause if I wait till the kids get up, I won't get anything done. And I want when they're during quarantine, I, I wanted it to be if the kids were awake, that's all I did. I didn't want to be doing any work. Mm -hmm. I still had a work day I had to do. You know, it wasn't like we weren't working. Uh, so, but I wanted I wanted Kylie, I wanted Blair to know that when they were awake, that dad was going to be with them, and they were the most important. So what I was doing, I would get up super early, and I would get my work done. And then when they woke up, I would spend time with them. And then at their nap time, I would work some more. And then when they woke up, I was, you know, that, that's kind of how I, the way I do balance is I kind of go, now granted, I'm a morning person. A lot of strength coaches were morning guys. Like I get up really early. I do my stuff then. That way when I am home, I'm home. You know, I, I schedule time in the morning for, okay, uh, from four to five, I'm doing professional development. From five to six, I'm getting stuff ready for the day. From six to seven, is I'm doing my own whatever I'm doing that day. I'm doing my own lift. I'm doing my own personal health stuff. You know, I've got it. I've got it on my calendar, so I know that that time is set aside. So I'm not constantly like, well, where's this going to fit in the day? What, where's this? The way I, the way for me to have balance is to know that it's already on the on the schedule. Mm -hmm. it's, it's structured. You know. My wife gives me a hard time because I'm, I'm really big on our budget, too. It's the same thing. How do I find balance in a budget if I'm not – if I don't track it and I'm not – you know, I can't do – if I can't uh, look and see where, where I need to spend more time, where am I where, – where I got too much time budgeted that I can take back and set stuff like that. And so I think for me, scheduling gives me the freedom to have balance in the sense that from – you know, so if I get up, Get up at four o'clock. I'm gonna go. I do my morning routine. Do my stuff. Well, four thirty. I start doing some professional development stuff. Well, at five o'clock, I'm done. At five o'clock, I'm done. Now my brain switches to whatever the next thing is, and so I, it's almost like I can flip my switches. So I can, when I am home, I'm not constantly thinking about what do I need. How am I gonna do this? What this? It's, I've got a time set aside for it, so I can be at that part of my of me. And then when I'm at home, I can be that part of me. And so I don't, I'm not constantly now, I mean, you don't ever stop thinking about the other thing. It's always kind of in the back of your head, but yeah. uh, I, I think balance to me comes from the freedom of, of scheduling and being disciplined to follow that schedule. I like that a lot, coach. And just for our listeners who are listening, I'm sure they want to take some things from you with you talked about with scheduling and prioritizing family and things like that. I mean, is there something that you would say is like a staple of your routine? Like I always, do this, this, and this in the morning. I always set time apart for this. Like anything that our listeners you think could take from that and, and do the same? Well, I've got, so my morning routine, especially like in the school week, like my phone goes off so much from four to 8 a.m. It's crazy. So like alarm, four o'clock, get up. Uh, 4.15, I need to be, I need to have everything packed up and ready to go. 4.30, I've got to be, I need to be at school by 4.30. Uh, that, that's like, that's my point, my goals. And, and if I don't meet, I, I'm not like, Super, you have to do, but I, I just have structure with it. So I kind of know, okay, what if I am running over a little bit? I need to, I need to cut some out. Um, you know, I know, I know then, it, so from 4.30 to 5, I'm usually listening to a podcast. I'm trying to take notes. I'm trying to focus on that. Uh, 5 o'clock, I have my quiet. I do, I do a meditation first to kind of help me just get rid of all thoughts. I, I meditate, listen, I'm so bad at, like, Meditation was such a good thing for me because I felt like I've got to, I've got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. Like there's so much stuff for me to sit still, even for, for 10 minutes. It's just like, I start shaking. Mm -hmm. you know? 
kid in elementary, like that little fifth grade kid in gym class, they tell us sit on your spot before we can play. And I just, I can't, I can touch and I just, my brain is going so much. Okay, so five o'clock, I'm going to meditate. I'm going to calm down. I'm going to get my mind clean of all the stuff up that the stuff I just learned on, get over it. I'm done. I'm done with it right now. I got to clear my mind. So then as soon as I'm done with that, I can do a good, spend some time in the word, do my quiet time. Um, that's usually about 5.30, 5.45-ish. Again, I've got another alarm to make to, to know when I need to go to the next thing. Uh, I try to lift from 6 to 6.45 every morning. Not lift, do something. Be, be active. Uh, from 6 to 6.45. Um, as soon as I finish lifting, I come down, make breakfast. It's usually the same thing because I like the same thing. Um, take a shower, and then as soon as I get done, I call my – I FaceTime my girls because they're usually up by that point. So Sarah's getting ready for school, and then I can see her, talk to her for a minute. I can talk to both my girls before school. So I can at least see them. You know, I've been gone for three hours, even though they were asleep and still been gone. But uh, that's kind of going back to that balance, you know, being able to see, you know, well, where's dad in the morning? Well, dad's at work, but, but he's, he's thinking about you. Just five minutes, you know, if that's all it is, but I can see them. Uh, and then just going – the school schedule takes over from there. But just kind of knowing – I don't have to be super disciplined on the – as soon as the alarm goes off, I have to do this, I have to do that. But it, it, it paces me to help me know what I need to be doing, when I need to start shifting to this or shifting to that. Um, you know, you got to have freedom to say, hey, I need to spend some more time on this and maybe take – got to have freedom to do that. Uh, but, again, just kind of having that, that structured routine it gives me the freedom to do that because i, I got to feel and I know where I can and can't take time away. Yeah, and the routine that you're saying and describing, I mean, it is that's a that's an amazing thing. I mean, I feel challenged just by listening to you say the consistency that you're trying to build. But like one of the things I'm hearing you say is prioritizing. Okay, putting God first, making sure that you're you're you know taking care of yourself, self care skills, and then also your family. Like right then, boom, face up. And like I love that. I love that you you know when you're you know your children are getting up and you're calling in and you're saying hello to Sarah and like tell them you're thinking about them. Cause that's huge. That's a huge takeaway of like, some people can just get so lucky and like, Oh, strength conditioning, this, 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 but it's like, no, like just because you're at there doesn't mean you can't send a phone call FaceTime for 10 minutes, five minutes, whatever it is. So, I mean, I, I really appreciate you sharing that. And I'm curious to know specifically with that 30 minute professional development side, what are the things that you do to like grow yourself? Okay. And even with like your routine, maybe dive into a little bit more um, detailed plan on like, how do you, there's so much information. There's so many ways to read the Bible for professional development and spiritual growth. How do you structure what to do? And then what does that actually look like? Practically speaking. So I'll start with the professional development there. Um, so this month, you know, you got the RSCC stuff with NSCA. So I've got to do some of those. That's pretty easy. I, I'm, I just work a little bit on that every day when I'm done with it. I'm done. Uh, typically it's podcast and I don't, I've gotten, I've gotten really good. I didn't, I was really nervous at first, not finishing the whole thing. Like I wanted to be able to sit and listen to the whole thing. Um, but I got, I've gotten really good at just stopping and being, pick, being able to pick back up. But again, it's cause I'm taking notes now so I can, I, and I don't try to, I don't try to, you know, make a manuscript of the whole thing. I just try to, I try to listen and, and I almost try to visualize what they're talking about and whether it's them in the weight room or, or what it, you know, if it's, you know, it's not always, I don't, it's not always a strength conditioning podcast. It's a leadership podcast. It's, you know, I listen to a couple of churches on there. Uh, it's whatever it is I'm listening to. I'm trying to visualize what they're saying, take good notes on it so that I can then, you know, translate it to me and, and help understand my life and how I can apply it and how I can grow from it. Uh, so from professional development side, that's kind of how I t approach that. And on the other side of it, um, in terms of my spiritual development, you know, I, one thing I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to do better is uh, to, to memorize scripture. And I, I've just, I just, in the past couple of weeks, have been trying to, to really hone back in on that. So don't ask me to quote anything right now because I'll screw it up. <laughs> but that's, but I, I have to know the areas that I'm weak in. You know, that's where I can kind of take those audits from, from the schedule and from, from what I do. And, and so I can kind of take an audit and say, okay, well, done good at this but what about this and I need to revisit this and, uh, and that comes kind of from that meditation I've tried to focus and, and see things and, you know listen to other people like what are they doing to, to help mm -hmm. um, that's 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 kind of when I when I'm in that mode I want to be in that mode 
You know, I want to be present and learning so I can then practically apply it later. If I'm just listening to something, just it's background noise. Like that's not what, what I just wasted 30 minutes that I could have been spending on doing something else. You know, I could have spent that back home with, with the kids, you know, but if I'm going to, if I'm going to be willing to, it's got to be some sort of trade. You know, we all have the same amount of time. Mm-hmm. Trade my time for it. It's got to be worth value. Uh, because if I don't get the value of it from it, then it's going to creep back in later and take time and take valuable time from my kids and my wife later. So yeah. I've got to maximize it when I'm in it. Um, that, that's what kind of helps me keep on track. And listen, I don't, I don't want this to sound like I've got some guru of, of this, <laughs> I follow this thing perfect. I don't want it to sound like that. That's my goal. That's what I'm trying to do every day. Yeah. Um, but I've learned that when I, when I, the, the times that I follow it better and I, one, I've given myself more freedom. But two, I see myself growing more because I'm able to practically apply what I'm learning. The times that I'm not good at it, it's just like I'm listening to something. Like, what the heck did I just, like, what did I do? Like, I, what do I, how am I improving from that? You know, if yeah. I don't, what did I learn from that? What did I, you know, how do, how do I then respond when I fail? What do I, how do I use what I, what I just learned when I felt like I, I don't know? So uh, that's kind of my, my approach to it. Yeah, and Man, Justin, I, I mean, I'm taking notes on this. This is phenomenal. Like if I can summarize that kind of what you're saying, what I'm hearing you say is consistency of being in the moment. That's your core value. That's kind of what you're saying. You're saying when it's time to do professional development, you're locked in, you're not wasting your time. Like you're visualizing, you're taking notes, it's meaningful. And you're able to hit pause and then pick it up maybe the next day. And then it's time to switch over to like spiritual focus and really clearing your mind so you can focus on what God is teaching you through scripture, memory, and whatever else, you know, God's leading you to. But it's being in that moment and then moving with purpose from task to task because you only have 24 hours and prioritizing the things that are most important in your life. I mean, that's kind of what I'm, what I'm thinking, Justin. I mean, I'm learning a lot from yeah. this. Yeah. Coach, one thing I'm hearing you say a lot just from getting to know you from our brief conversation is I feel like you're constantly talking about other people. You know, I feel like you're constantly talking about your wife, your kids, the kids you work with. And yes, we're asking you questions about your routine and your habits because we want to take from that. But I know you're a humble guy, so you're not going to admit it, but you seem like an incredibly selfless person. And, you know, I think just everyone in this profession, a lot of the coaches are more so selfless people because this is a service oriented profession. I mean, you, you, it's really hard to have an ego in strength and conditioning and be successful because it's really service, you know, throughout the entirety of your day. And so, you know, for our listeners who want to grow in that area and continue to, you know, um, be better at serving the people around them. I mean, what do you feel like keeps you grounded in terms of, you know, constantly being a servant, constantly serving others, whether it's your wife, your kids, um, the athletes you work with, what, what do you think keeps you grounded there? I think one of the big things is remembering, I'm going to specifically speak on being a coach. I don't exist as a coach if there's no kids to be coached. Wow. So if I, if there's no kids to be coached, like I don't, I'm not the most important. Now I've got to be good. Now if I'm just some dude in here just that is labeled coach, like, well, that's not, that doesn't mean, like, I've got to be in there to make impact on the positive impact on those kids. Mm-hmm. When the kids aren't there, I mean, I've got to, I got to be able to reach to them. You know, I'm not a dad without my kids. So I've got to continue to, to, to maximize the time that I've got with them and, and the love on them. And, and listen, I don't have, it doesn't take me long to bring up memories of things that I've screwed up. So it's easy to stay humble when you remember, uh, remember the things you did wrong. You know, Charlie was on the, on the bad end of that. When I was, a, uh, when I was a GA in a Carson Newman, for example, you know, it was like in my mind, I was like, okay, I'm the coach now. I get to decide what we do. I get, to, I can now make all those kids that I thought didn't go hard during conditioning. I can make them go hard. And so, listen, I didn't care. You sprinted every step, or we do it again. I didn't care. I don't care if we. I don't care if we didn't develop. In my mind, there was no science in my mind. It was almost like retribution in my mind. Now we can, we can do it the way I think we should have done it. And listen, they gave me a hard time. I was like, I don't care. I don't like. I was so I was such a bad GA. I was an awful coach. I was again. It, it wasn't about the people. Was, your vulnerability there, coach. <laughs> well, it, I mean, it's embarrassing what it was. It was it was embarrassing. And I'm thankful. I'm just thankful I got hired after that because I, I. It was about me. It was all about me. My program, what I wanted to do, and so I got, I can go through that even when I got hired here. Like I can do that at the house. Like I've screwed up so many times. I can remember that. I don't even remember the times I don't. You know, <laughs> that's even more times. So when you when you can remember all of those things, it's not hard to get your ego out of it because you can run like you're not. 
not that good anyways. I've got to improve. And, it, and it's not that I've got to improve. I've got to, what I've got to improve on is getting out of the way so that Jesus can live through me. Mm, amen. It's, it's me, if it, again, going back to the very first thing we talked about, me wanting to control. When I control stuff, we are limited. When I give up control, we find way more success. Is it a bad person? No, it's because it's not about me. People I'm with, it's about the kids that I'm, I'm getting to serve, the coaches I'm getting to serve, about my kids, about my wife. It's about Jesus getting to, to use me. Not me, Jesus, you know? And so it's there. Now, listen, again, I screw that up, but I've got to I remind myself constantly about they're not, they're not here for me. They're not here for me. They're not here for me. Now, I've got to provide a good product, but they're not here for me, Jesus. And so I've got to, to remember that's what I'm in there to be. It, it reminds me of just being a Christian. I mean, if, if we're trying to walk through life as being a Christian, holding on, and trying to get control, like that's when it becomes focused on us and our wants and our desires. But it's like, no, we should be letting go, like holding on to the things that, you know, or letting go of uh, our, our desires and our control and saying, God, you have control today. What is your will for my life? What is the things that you desire for me to be like? And we see it through scripture, you know, and I'm just seeing this servant heart just kind of easily just through the words you're saying, I'm seeing you as a servant. And that's what we have to be as coaches is serving. We have to be focused on Jesus. We have to be focused on living on a daily basis by being consistent. And that's I'm I'm feeling very encouraged by you, Coach. Um, all right, we got a fun little uh, mentor minute challenge type thing. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a quick question about mentorship. Mentors. Okay, you got about 60 seconds on each question. So just you know you can talk about it, but just give give us pretty much the straightforward answer. All right, you ready for this? I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna be as short as I can be. <laughs> All right, so, so coach, what makes a great mentor? Ready, go. Uh, for me, I think what makes a great mentor is, I would say, an intentional, authentic relationship. You know, like if, if whether you're the mentor or the mentee, I think it's you, you have to, to be intentional about either teaching or learning, and you have to have authenticity in it. Like, you can't just be like, okay, well, this is what a good leader should do. No, like, you learn through, well, hey, I just screwed this up. This don't, you should never do that. I just messed it up. Or, you know, hey, this was really good. We need, to, we need to continue to capitalize on that. And again, the relationship. It's not necessarily, hey, I'm here to teach you or you can learn from me. Let's walk, let's go through this part of life together. So an intentional, authentic relationship. Nice. Awesome. Man, that was 40 seconds. Well done. Hey. <laughs> All right. So uh, how do you find a mentor? Ready, go. You know, sometimes you seek them out. Sometimes they end up seeking you out. And what I mean by that, like, that's good. Sometimes there's people that are in your life, just, just in your life, and they're great mentors to you because you develop a relationship with them, and, and it just kind of naturally occurs. There's some people that come into your life that you aren't expecting to come into your life that end up be, you build a great relationship, and they end up mentoring you or vice versa. And then there's people that you specifically seek out to say, hey, I, you know, I, will you teach me this or that or or you know, can we build this relationship? Um, you know, I, I think back in Jeremiah, it says, you know, when you, you seek me, you'll find me. When you search for me with all your heart. Um, I think when, when we are, like I said, sometimes we're seeking them out and we find them. But sometimes people that God places in your life end up being some of the better, best mentors you never expected. 50 seconds. Well done. <laughs> no, that's, that's incredible. I mean, I, I agree completely. Like sometimes mentors are just in your life. You know, like we had football coaches in our life. And then there's other times where it's like, you know, I really want to seek out to be like this guy in some ways and, and seeking them out. So last question here, what would be your advice? Okay. Best advice, two part question. What would be your best advice in order to become a mentor to somebody or in order to uh, get mentored by somebody else? Go. I think with, with that, it'd be kind of going back to what I said, you know, like being, being real and authentic where on, on both mm -hmm. You, yeah. You've got to be real and authentic in what you need to grow in, but also what you're trying to teach. If you're the mentor, like you've got to be authentic with what, what's going on in this situation. Like, why did you make this choice? Why did you make this mistake? And you can't hide that. You can't, you can't, yeah. you've got to be willing. If you're going to be willing to grow, you've got to be willing to be changed, whether you like it, whether it's good or bad. And it's nothing personal. It's just, you, you've got to be able to improve. And so without that authentic portion of it, there can be no mentor or mentee because there's no growth from that transparent presentation of that. Amen. Amen. Awesome.
45 crushed seconds, it. three for three. Crushed <laughs> Absolutely crushed it. Absolutely crushed it. And, and one of the things too, Zach, that I, I love that you're saying is being real and authentic. I mean, think about it from, um, you know, being teachable. What, what's the purpose of even trying to get mentored in the first place? You want to learn something. You want to have growth in an experience. So to be real and to be authentic, that's, that is a key in order to be mentored and also with being a mentor towards somebody else. Um, there's a great book out there by this guy named Bob Beal and it's called, it's called Mentoring. And he talks about two simple questions to ask if you're somebody who is trying to mentor somebody. It's, it's fo- first of all, it's focused on the person you're trying to mentor, but it's saying, what are your priorities? How can I help? Bottom line, that's what a mentor does. They say, what are your priorities? How can I help? And they share from their background, their experience. They can provide resources. But that's just one of the things that, uh, you know, this guy, Bob Beal, he does a phenomenal job talking about mentorship and, and just the value of it. And, like, honestly, we as coaches, we're mentors. We're all mentors in some way. Um, so thank you for answering that. Great job. Well, and, and kind of just to expand, you know, I got, like, 30 bonus seconds I didn't actually use. <laughs> it's true. My wife's, my wife's a kindergarten and first grade teacher. So she goes back and forth each year with her kids. She doesn't dog cuss her kids because they can't write when they come to kindergarten. That's just not how it works. You know, so you, when you talk about mentorships or be on the other side of it, like the purpose of it isn't like you do, like you are to get to here. Like it's, it's to, to develop that relationship, to go alongside, to help aid them in that process. Because those kindergartners, mm-hmm. they can't take those AP classes if they don't learn to do that stuff first. You know, like mm-hmm. understand the person's at in their, in that, that phase life and being willing to go alongside them and say, hey, this is the next thing we need to do. And this is the next thing we need to do. Then this is the next thing. Not just like, hey, if you want to be at the top, you got to be at the top. Like, no. Figure out where they're at. Walk with them from there. Use your experiences to guide you and be willing to say, hey, I don't know this. Let's go to somebody else here. I know I might be mentoring you or, or but I, I'm not the expert here. This mm-hmm. experience, I don't know if it helps you here. Be willing to say, hey, somebody else might have a better answer. Uh, so, Love that, Coach. That's phenomenal. Yeah, and so shifting gears a little bit now to the next couple of questions we want to ask you. You've kind of made the perfect segue in that. You're talking a lot about growth. And I'm sure there have been ways you've grown as a coach throughout your own um, career, and you've shared some of those things with us already. Um, is there, like, one, like, biggest thing that you feel like you've been through as a strength and conditioning coach that you'd say that was, like, my biggest learning experience um, that you want to share with, with the listeners? I, I don't want to say it's one moment so much as it is – a collection of moments over really my first semester back in the high school setting. Kids don't like jerks. They're not going to, they don't want to be coached by jerks. At the end of the day, when I am the problem, when the program suffers, I'm the problem. The way I present it, if a kid doesn't learn, it's because I didn't teach him. It's not because the kid's not teachable or the kid's not coachable. I didn't figure out, my job is to figure out how to teach or coach them. You know, my job is to find a way to encourage and motivate them, not say, well, they just don't care. Maybe they don't. Well, give them a reason yeah. to. Yeah. Like, you know, the, if the world says, well, if, if Jesus, if God is so good, then why this? Well, I've got to give them a reason to look to, to say, well, why should I be going to Jesus? If I don't have a reason, then why would they ever say I need to go to him? Why would, why? Like, and so I, I think that early, that first semester back when I came in and basically just said, you will do it my way. I don't care. And I would scream and I would yell and I would, I would throw a little temper tantrum if you didn't do it the way I wanted you to. Rather than coming alongside the kid and saying, hey, this is where you're at. Let's try to get you to the next step and to the next step and to the next step. I, I, had, to, I had to really learn that in order to give, get, I had to give. You know, again, that's that letting go of control of I've got to get myself. I love that. And when I get myself out of the way, good things happen. But when I put myself in the front, it never works. And so that's that first time really opened my eyes to it. Now I'm not, I didn't change immediately. It took me some time to figure that out. Um, but I would say in the last five years, we've really come a long way because I get more and more out of the way. I've, I've learned how to, I, I still put myself back in, in right, right back in the front of it from time to time. And I, but I've learned how to put myself back out of the way. Um, and so I think that's, that's probably my biggest lesson. And quick follow up on that coach. So one thing I feel like you're saying constantly is the theme of ownership, right? I feel like, constantly whenever you say you've made a mistake or you weren't at your best I feel like you don't ever pass the buck and so what is ownership to you I just think you know if I'm I always told our kids you know and I, I forget where, where I heard it where I 
maybe I think my grandfather might have told it to me. Maybe my uncle when I was little, you know, he said, if you're ever, if you're gonna do anything in life, it's got if you're willing to put time into doing something, you've got to be willing to put 100 percent into it. You've got to be willing to have fun regardless of the outcome. You've got to be willing to find joy. You've got to be willing to do to to do the things that it takes to be successful at that. And I just, you know, if I'm gonna do something, I'm putting, you know, it's something that's really big to me, you know. So I, my name, my, Zach is what I go by, but I'm actually, my first name's actually Tilden. My dad's name is Tilden. My grandfather's name is Tilden. Uh, if I ever have a son, his name's going to be Tilden. It's just, it's, it, it, the, the family name is important to me. So I, if I do something, I'm not just representing me. I'm representing my wife. I'm representing my kids. I'm representing my dad, my granddad. I'm representing every Fleming that came before me. I'm representing Dobbins Bennett. I'm representing Kingsport. You know, I've, that just has been ingrained in me by my, my, my family from such a young age that ownership to me is that what I'm doing, it impacts not just me, it impacts everybody around me. And so I've got to take ownership in, in just my little app, my little part so that we can be successful. I don't, if I don't execute my part, well, we won't be successful anyways. Um, and so, you know, and you, you take that in, into the body of Christ, like if I don't execute, like sometimes we start thinking that, that up in Northeast, my little part of Northeast Tennessee is not significant, not this or that. No, that one kid that I've got, the one kid is important. Okay, that one kid is important to Jesus. The one kid that showed up to the, the session, it wasn't a wasted session because 399 of them didn't show up. It was an awesome session because there was one kid that you got to really pour into. Yep. Uh, yeah. And, yep. and the ownership is that, hey, Jesus has trusted me with this kid what, rather than ownership well, I got to get all 400 kids in here or it's a waste. No, that's, that's not ownership. That's, that's an ego is what that is. That's me saying, well, if I don't have them all, it's not worth it. No, the one is worth it. And so I've got to be willing to, to love that one. And that one kid might change the whole world. I don't know. I don't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. My job is to love them, not to worry about what they do, but to love them. Man, so many, so many sayings and, and, phrases that he's throwing out here i mean in order to to get you got to give right and you got to give of yourself and i i love i love that idea i mean that's been a theme you've been saying this whole podcast is take ownership you know focus on giving it's not about you get out of the way right those types of things so my last question uh in regards to just kind of like lessons that you've learned what would be if you could talk to uh, a younger strength coach somebody who's brand new trying to get into the field um from a spiritual standpoint okay what would be uh, some practical advice you'd want to give them? And then also from a strength and conditioning standpoint, besides the things you've already been laying out here. Yeah. Um, so from a, from a spiritual standpoint, something that's been really important for me. Um, one of my best friends in high school had, had moved away. He's actually a youth pastor back here in Kingsport now. Cool. And so reconnecting with somebody that was outside of, he, he actually coached here for a little bit. So that's kind of how we reconnected. Uh, but finding somebody who's outside of, strength conditioning who's out who who cares about what we do but is outside of coaching a little bit that can give me perspective outside of the normal people that I get perspective from is really really important um you know my my dad is not in he's not in sports he's retired now but he was in you know government so that's somebody I can go to but, but being will but finding people that are outside of what you do every day to mm -hmm. give perspective because the things that I get mad about, well, sometimes when I go tell them about it, like, why are you getting mad about that? That's like, that's stupid. Like, <laughs> couldn't do that, you know? So if I can't see it from the other side, then I, I my, my perspective is limited, you know, so yeah. my is limited. Um, so that, that's my, my advice spiritually. Um, I would say strength conditioning wise is be flexible. Um, and I know I've kind of alluded to that, but like, Early on, I remember some of our coaches would come in and they would, we would start working and they say, hey, I, I don't know if I really want to do this. Can we do this instead? That's stupid. Why? No, why would we do that? But it's not dangerous. So guess what? We'll do it your way with my way mixed in. And then every year or every whatever, they start to trust you a little bit more. Because I didn't just come in some storm and say, no, dadgummit, we're doing it my way. I don't, you, you coach your sport and I'll coach the way for no. That's not how it works. Mm -hmm. They aren't in there because they're weightlifters. They're in there because of the sport, first off. Right. I'm a piece of the puzzle. I'm mm -hmm. not the puzzle. I'm a piece. And so I've got to be willing 
I've got to be the puzzle piece that you can twist and turn and put however they need it to be to fit into the grand scheme of things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sometimes you get kids before practice, sometimes after, sometimes, you know, we, we, have, we don't have flexibility things you got to have as a coach, but I think flexibility of relationships and talking to coaches and not making demands, but figuring out what they want, yeah. and how to work with them, that you can work with their athletes to maximize what they're coming in there to get. We can go all day with this conversation. I, mean, I feel like if we ever did like a built to last documentary, we might just have to follow you around coach Fleming and just like talk to you all day. And like, this stuff's great. I don't want to finish it up. Um, but we do finish every show with what we call our fast finishers and um, three questions. I'll just read it to you. It's just favorite book, favorite Bible verse or story from the Bible. And then how do you define success? Um, we'll take them one at a time though, but they're really kind of short and sweet, but uh, what's your favorite book coach? I, I want to say, uh... I've really learned to be a better reader. I was a terrible reader coming out of high school. Um, so, so a book that really, when I was learning how to read, like and really apply stuff, was it's a book called Burn Your Goals. Oh, uh, I read that one. It's phenomenal. Listen, Coach Parks got it. Some guy sent it in the mail to him, and, and uh, I was a GA there. And he said, Here, he said, you want to read this? Sure. So I start reading it, and there's grammar errors. And like it's short, and it's like a page and a half for a chat. Like it was, it was my love. It was my, it was, it spoke to me because I could understand. I was like, oh shoot. Like the grammar was my grammar. <laughs> it was awesome. And so, but it just, it really, that, that kind of kick started a, just a different viewpoint, a uh, different perspective on how to approach things. And so that kind of opened me up to being willing to, to change and grow and learn from some of the things that came after. But that book was really paramount early on for me to, to learn how to be willing to change and grow. Yeah, that's a great book for anybody listening. If you're looking for a great one, I think it's by uh, Joshua Medcalf and uh, Jamie Gilbert, I think is the other guy's name. Yeah, that's, that's, that's his last name. Yeah, and it's like a 400 page book. It's thick, but it's like each chapter is like three pages, four pages. Oh, yeah, it's totally. like quick hitters, you know? But um, cool. So, next one favorite verse or story from the Bible? Yeah, I kind of went back and forth on this. Um, you know, I talked about, I thought about like David. Uh, I think it's. I think it's first Samuel 17. I think it's verse 45 when it talks about, you know, you come, you know, talking to Goliath, you know, you come to me with your short, your sword and your shield and all this stuff. You know, I come to you in the name of the Lord. And that's, that's all I got. And that's fine. <laughs> I kind of toyed with that one. And I, that, that one was really impactful for me. Uh, this is my college years. Something that's really been big to me. And I, you know, now that I think about it, really, we've talked about it for the past hour uh, in Luke chapter nine, verse 23 through 25. Jesus kind of says, you know, if, if anyone wants to come follow me, they've got to deny themselves, basically, away from you, pick up your cross and follow me. Mm-hmm. Anybody wants to gain their life, they've got to, to, to lose it for my sake. If you want to you know, gain everything, you've got to come find me. And so, again, being realizing that it is not me, realizing that I am supposed to be an embodiment of Christ and that I've got to turn away from my natural desires and inclinations and give up this world. You know, I, like I told our kids yesterday, we had our final exam. I said, guys, I hope you know that when you, you leave this class, like one day you're not going to be athletes. One day you're not going to be students. One day you're not going to be, you're going to be human though. You're going to be a person. And I hope that one, you know how to go and train and stay healthy. But two, I hope you know how to value people. I hope you know how to, to, to manage relationships. I hope you know how to manage your own relationship, you know, your own self. Um, and so, but but being willing to, to get out of the way of that and you know, focus on relationship and focus on Christ. Uh, that's probably my favorite verse there. Those are great. Those are great. Um, last one. How do you define success? You know, I, I, I feel like I'm just, I go back to what, to Wooden's definition of it. You know, I just, I want to know that I maximized what I had with what I had but I want to know that I was, I made the changes that were necessary. Mm-hmm. Did I do everything I can with the natural things I have? And then to make the adjustments that were necessary along the way. Did I realize that I messed this up, so I changed it. So I was not the reason that we were held back for this. And I'm not trying to say so I can put blame on somebody else. But, but I think, you know, as much as it is, did I do everything I could, can do to be successful? was I willing to be changed so that success could actually come through me? Because if I'm not willing to change, then success can come through me because I'm naturally, like I'm born to screw it up. That's what humans do. And so I think that's kind of the way I view that. Yeah, I absolutely love that because 
I mean, that's a great definition of success. It's, it's honoring to the Lord with using the abilities that he's given you. And did you adapt and adjust? Were you able to, you know, be flexible? Like you were saying earlier, were, were you able to make that halftime adjustment when you see things that God's working on, the Holy Spirit's working on, you know, and humility, gentleness, kindness, patience, whatever it is. Um, well, cool coach. Hey, phenomenal episode, Zach. Uh, if our listeners, okay, we want to create an environment where people can connect. And, and if they want to reach out to you and talk further about some of the things that were mentioned on this episode, how can they get in con- contact with you? Uh, so I'm on social media, uh, coach underscore Fleming 55. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on those. I'm not super active on it. Just, I, I it's one of these, not super high. Like I'm on it and I look at stuff, but I just, I, you know, I, like I retweet DB stuff. I post pictures of the kids, but I'm not like strength conditioning, super active. Uh, so I'm on those. Uh, probably the best way to get a hold of me would be either my email or my cell phone. Uh, my email is just zfleming at k12k.com. And then my cell phone is 423-863-3117. Um, and, you know, text messaging and sometimes on the phone, like if I open it up, or like I got one of those fancy watches that my daughter can hit and it opens a message up and then I never see it. Uh, hmm. It texted me like a month ago and I saw it yesterday and I was like, Oh shoot. <laughs> yeah. I, didn't see it. I had no idea. And so email for me is like the easiest for that stuff. Cause I can hit unread and like put a reminder on there and it like pops up until I, until I respond to it. Um, sometimes I don't think it's the, it didn't feel like the most genuine though. I feel like sometimes on the phone it's, it feels, a, I don't know if it's now emails and text messages are on the phone anyway, so it don't matter. I don't know. I, I Email's easier, but I prefer text. How about that? <laughs> there we go. All right. Well, hey, uh, we would love to pray for you. Thank you for being vulnerable to be able to share all that stuff uh, as far as how people can contact you. But, uh, you know, we reached out to you earlier and you were saying um, patience and perspective. Okay. Patience and perspective are two big things that you were wanting prayer about. You know, it's so easy to get stuck in um, letting your emotions kind of dictate your actions. Is there anything else, uh, Zach, that we can be praying for you here on this, uh, on this podcast episode? Uh, my, my oldest daughter's turning three in about two months. And so, so Kylie, yeah, so Kylie's turning three in a few months and you know, just all the struggles you get with the three year old, the blessings, of course, but just, you know, it's kind of like at the end of the day, I've got to remind myself when I get home, I don't care how tired you are. She needs you to be her dad and yeah, you got to lead her to be, she's still learning. So I, that that's one of the things for her. And then obviously for, for Blair as well, you know, she's almost to the point where she's walking. So I guess for her, my, my prayer is just for like calm because as soon as she gets mobile and we got two, Lord have mercy, it's going to be crazy. They, they, <laughs> both of them are too much like me. I need them to be more like their mom. They're too active <laughs> like me. They're just like, if they can get into it, they get into it. So, and then my wife, man, I just, I, I always try to pray for her too. Just, she's a trooper. I can't, I, there's no way I can do what I do without her being the servant that she is, you know, Basketball season's hard because there's so many nights a week she's doing stuff. Football's hard. She's got both girls in the stands by herself. Um, but she, man, she she's awesome. She's so unbelievable. And just uh, I'm trying to pray for her just for strength and sanity. She deals with the kids way, way more than I do. It's hard. It, it's so hard on her. Um, and so just, one, praying that she's got the strength to get through it. Uh, I pray that I, I show her that I love her every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, let me uh, close this out here in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Zach, Coach Fleming. Uh, thank you for allowing him to be able to come on this podcast episode. And I just pray that this episode will encourage many of our listeners. I pray specifically for um, for Kylie and Blair, um, his two daughters, that you would bless them, Lord. Um, allow them to grow in, in health and also in their relationship with you one day, God. I pray that you would just open up the opportunity for them to come into a relationship with you. I pray specifically for Kylie, Lord, as she's turning three, that that Zach can lead her well and continue to just um, disciple her well and, and lead spiritually, Lord. And and for Blair, as she's uh, learning how to walk and getting a little bit older, I pray that you would give Zach patience and give him um, just uh, wisdom to know how to continue to care for his his daughters well and to be fully present, Lord, with his daughters. And also, I pray for Sarah, for uh, Zach's wife. I pray that you would bless uh, her with trying to be a, a great wife, a support to Zach and, and a great mother to their two daughters. I pray that you would give her strength and may your grace be sufficient because it is God. Help her to remember that, Lord, and, and help Zach, uh, last of all, Lord, to, 
to grow in his knowledge of you and in leading his family well spiritually, Lord, and, and finishing well with uh, the school year kind of ending and having some time off for a little bit. I pray that you would help Zach to just recover and recuperate and also with um, just getting proper perspective on things, God, give him an eternal mindset and um, just a proper understanding of how to live out uh, his faith by loving you and loving uh, his wife well and being a faithful husband, a faithful father, God. So thank you again for our friendship and for this opportunity we had to, to be able to connect on this uh, podcast episode. May you continue to bless uh, the rest of our time here. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to the Built to Last podcast, where we encourage, equip, and empower coaches to live out their core values where they live, work, and wherever they build relationships. Have a blessed day, striving to build lasting impact.